And yeah, so what do we what do we degree on? on phones, what do we degree what do we dis uh, disagree on Byzantine SCOTUS? What do we? Here's a question that I think: What is the purpose of the will if the will if judgment is located within the intellect? It seems to me that almost everything that the will it's important about the will in Scotism is simply assimilated to the intellect within Thomism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. So um, I actually have a quote from Thomas on this one. Surprise, you know, I want to point out, while you're looking it up, I just want to point out one thing. When you first talked about uh, mm -hmm. Thomas, like, oh, do you want to hear about Thomas? And Tom I think this is the, the first day I was in your Discord. I thought you meant the, the apostle. So I was incredibly confused for like two hours of what you meant. <laughs> the, here I we go. You meant the, Cr the apostle Thomas. Christian like, de defends that the Thomas Thomas? Christian, defend that St. Thomas Aquinas and the Apostle Thomas are the same person and all these and all the writings of the Summa come from the first century. Based. Based. It's like pseudo Dionysius. Yeah, he, he quotes Dionysius because he was friends with him. Okay. <laughs> Just, yeah, the, re I, the reason Dionysius looks like he's sixth century is because he was compiling quotes from the Summa to recreate the writings. Yeah, what I think you have wrong here. Why can't I'm I? I'm reloading this? again. And I'm gonna pull up I don't have Scotus on hand. I don't want to go search through the sumo, but I want to pull up Bonaventure to defend Scotus's view here. <laughs> Since Bonaventure is a doctor of the church. No, I think you. Uh, I think the problem here is that you're misunderstanding um, the nature of free will and the will in in Thomism. Yeah, because the way that you're viewing it is that the oh she Alex is I'm gonna add him back. Yeah, I reloaded it because lagging. Yeah, yeah. So um, in in Thomism you kind of phrase it like the the will is just uh f following and uh always after the judgment of the intellect and that's just what Th thomas believes but that's not really the case as it appears in summa theologiae prima pars question 83 article 3 where he says uh, of the question of whether the free will is an aptitive power or cognitive which you would say that thomas believes is a cognitive but he says the proper act of free will is choice for we say that we have free will because we can take one thing while refusing another. And this is okay. choose. therefore we must consider the nature of free will by considering the nature of choice. Now, two things concur in choice. Notice two things concur in choice yeah. right there. One on the part of the cognitive power, the other on the part of the aptitive power on the part of the cognitive power counsel is required, which is judgment by which we judge one thing to be preferred to another. On the part of the aptitive power, it is required that the appetite should accept the judgment of the counsel. So really, the will in Thomas's view isn't pure, uh, purely following after judgment, okay. but it is the it is the concurrence of the aptitive and the uh, and, and the judicial faculty. So would you say then that something in some sense can be simply the result of the will choosing one thing over another? So can it be that right if there's a piece of chocolate cake sitting in front of me and a piece of apple pie sitting in front of me that I can choose the chocolate cake simply because the will prefers the chocolate cake over the apple pie or does there have to be some reason behind it? Can we have a purely? Um, yeah, can, can the will just? Can the will simply choose between alternatives? If there's two, if there's multiple goods. So or does you're it have asking to choose about a whether, good always? Whether, yeah. whether the will, whether the will can exist without judgment. No, because so we would say, for example, the bond of entrance good is that judgment is that choice between one or the other. That it's not. So bond of entry distinguishes here counsel from judgment right so he says um here we go this is um itinerarium three four he says the function of the power of choice is found in deliberation judgment and desire um so he's gonna have here we go oh, is this a deliberation i'm thinking of never mind deliberation and yeah consists in inquiring which is better this or that but um, so he's going to choose between better, but then fundamentally one choice is chosen over the other because of the will prefers that one over the other. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. My explanation. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, yeah. So, so you're acting what you're asking whether the uh, the choice can occur without the action of the rational faculty. Well, I would, I would say that appetite. the rational faculty is the will, but the will is so according to Aristotle in Metaphysics Book Nine, the difference between a natural power and a rational power is that a natural power always moves to its end, while a rational power has the free choice to choose between multiple different ends. And Scotus says then that the 
intellect is the natural power within the mind and the rash and this will is the rational power in the mind because things enter through the senses the intellect yeah. contemplates those things and learns about them basically and that's done necessarily it's just as necessary that your intellect contemplates that as that you <laughs> breathe or that your stomach digests food right so you can have some control over it but that control is still from your will right if you want to stop breathing you can will to stop to try and stop breathing but your will is still naturally uh -oh. moving towards that end uh -oh. Christian, we're trying to make Christian a scotus here. No. <laughs> oh, right. are, are, we, are we arguing for the priority of the will over the I, intellect? I, I'm trying to argue for the rationality of the will. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah the, but but so if the, you so the so um, anyways, right it's the will then is what chooses between things. The intellect has no choice but to move yeah. to its end. <laughs> okay. Well, the intellect just knows, but with the will, you're actually really following through and choosing. Yeah. Okay, but actually, when when Thomas Thomas treats this question in the second half of this, mm -hmm. that's very useful. So yeah. therefore, Aristotle leaves it in doubt whether the choice belongs principally to the aptitive or the cognitive power, since he says that choice is either an aptitive intellect or an intellectual appetite. But Ethics three three he inclines to it being an intellectual appetite when he describes choice as a desire proceeding from counsel. But the reason of this is because the proper object of choice is the means to the end, and this as such is in the nature of that good, which is called useful. Wherefore, since good as such is the object of the aptitive, it follows that choice is principally an act of the aptitive power, and thus free will is an aptitive power. Right. Hmm. So you're saying, but isn't it an aptitive power? Isn't it simply the appetite of the intellect then? Because Scotus does acknowledge that the mind so, is in some sense an appetite of the intellect, but he says it's primarily a rational faculty. From, so from I, what I, I understand, I'm not, I'm not doesn't, so okay, from what ahead. I understand of Scotus, and I think he follows Anselm in this, doesn't he think that the intellectual appetite has, a, and because there are two of these, it's indeterminate which one has a precedent unless there is a will to choose between the two options. Uh, between the intellectual appetite towards happiness and the intellectual appetite towards uh, justice? Yeah, I think that comes in, but I think that's distinct mm. from his overall, fr from this point about rationality. I think his two affections is a distinct but related point. Right. I was going to say, it, it, I think it might be a little related because at the very yeah, least, if, it's, if the intellect is uh, prior in some sense, it might be prior in the sense that it is giving, um, you know, yeah. an indeterminate uh, pull. But it's not oh, yeah. prior in the sense that it is doing, it's determining the action. I think the mm -hmm. will is the thing that's coming in later yeah. and picking whether or, and picking between justice and its happiness. And yeah, yeah and this is mm -hmm. why it, it has this, uh, it has this power to kind of like uh, make the decision, to make the decision. Um, yeah. 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 So I, I mean, I would, I would be in line with that too. Right. Yeah. Because, because what, what, what it's, so the intellect verifies something is true. So obviously from sensation, right. let's say I have this cup of water. Um, my sensory faculties bring it in. The passive intellect is uh, forming it as matter. And then my active intellect formalizes that into the object. Right. And in, in the fact that it turns it from potency of matter from my passive intellect through the sensory faculties to um, the actuality of form. And then my, my the faculty of judgment is what's going to... Uh, to to judge whether it's true or not and then the then the affections come in to where it's perceived as from a good or an evil mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not sure why why that's uh, a contestable um contestable well it seems then though that you're simply following what your intellect has necessarily no. what your intellect has determined to be the highest good no, not, well, not necessarily well, because because the appetite is the determinant factor of whether the, the hmm. choice goes through or not with what the intellect apprehends is true. Right. So one thing to consider, though, is that um, so the doctrine of the tub of two appetites would basically state that um, there is a, a capacity to recognize something as the good and something and the ability to recognize something as one's own happiness. Uh, so f uh, let's just take uh, the drinking of water. Um, there is a sense in which drinking water is good, not it, uh, because your proper function is to hydrate yourself. But there is a sense in which it is, it causes you happiness and joy because you kind of take a, a certain pleasure in drinking water. And 
and basically uh, because those two more or less uh, line up, you don't really have much of a reason to deliberate, you know, unless you kind of have a higher joy in drinking Coca-Cola over water or something like that. Um, but because there's this indeterminacy that goes on, I think the, it, the intellect doesn't really uh, determine an outcome so much as it determines options of, po of potential outcomes. And it's the, w and it's the will that has priority in actualizing those poten those uh, potentials. Here you go. Christian, if you want to pull it up on the screen, I got the spot from SCOTUS here. We, we could go through that maybe a little oh, bit. Oh, no, you're going to read SCOTUS? Isn't this like the infamously difficult thing to do? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is from his questions on the metaphysics of Aristotle. This is from the, the collection of writings of SCOTUS about the will and morality. So here we go. Let me see if I can go through and find within SCOTUS where his actual argument is. Wait, what? 45 what, uh, minutes later. So it's uh, Metaphysics 9. Yeah, he's talking. He's just he's commenting on Ooh. Metaphysics 9 here. Let me bring Where in Metaphysics 9, do you know? I yeah. don't know. The verse he's quoting from Aristotle is It is clear some potencies will be non rational and others will be with reason. Hence, all arts or productive sciences um, um, are potencies. Okay, give me one second, and then mm -hmm. read that again, and I will try to figure out which one it is. Oh, uh, rational and irrational potencies. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they, yeah. There you go. And what did you say? What was the what was the sentence? So it is clear some potencies will be non-rational, but others will be with reason. Hence, all the arts or productive sciences are potencies. Oh, that's just the first. That's just the first sentence. Okay. Yeah. There we go. A uh, uh, metaphysics nine. Yeah, yeah, Metaphysics 9, um, it's under Lecture 2, so it's going to be uh, 1046, A36. Yeah, I'll just sort of okay. read through, but try and skip over objections so we can figure out. So he's asking, is the difference Aristotle assigns between the rational and irrational potencies appropriate? Namely, that the former are capable of contrary effects, um, but the latter produce uh, but one effect. So we, I'm, I'll skip over the objections here for now. Mm -hmm. Um... Here we go. All right. To the contrary uh, is the philosopher's statement in the text cited above. All right. You should, you should like that. He's just citing Aristotle as his proof. <laughs> 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 All right. So as for the question, granting the distinction be well made, we must first see how it is understood and then uh, what its rationale is. All right, so how is the distinction to be understood? So as to the first, keep in mind that any act of potency whatsoever, be it a power to act in a certain way or an ability to produce um, something, is such so long as its nature remains unchanged, it only does what it can do for itself. Frig frigidity, for remaining frig uh, frigidity, for example, cannot warm or draw heat from itself. Um, if it is not this sort of agent, it's basically it has to have that power in order, and it's always going to do that. Then, if it's a natural power, uh, no matter the circumstances might be, if something associated with it peripherally, for instance, could produce some heat in something, it never could be frigidity qua frigidity that could do this, right? So, an ex another example of this I've heard is that it seems like the sun, for example, can both dry clay and melt ice. So in one case, it's getting rid of water. In one case, it's adding water. What is it doing? But it's, of course, doing it in different respects, right? It's producing the same effect of heating both. And that's moving that water through these states. It's not actually producing different effects in each one. Yeah, it has so that's a, just a difference. It's, it has two active potencies, basically. Well, I think Scotus would say it's a singular activity it's doing that is affecting mm. the objects in different ways. But he's saying it, the sun, for example, couldn't do something contrary to heating it. Well, right? that's that's just the, the effect of uh, matter being disposed to the reception of form in a certain way. Because yeah. an, active, an active potency is going to affect a certain form on a certain thing. But mm. if the matter is, is disposed in a certain way, then the reception of the form will be different. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So, oh, so all he's saying here basically is that something a natural power can't do opposite things. That's what he's saying. Right. Whereas the yeah. intellect is the sort of thing which uh, can do opposite things. Well, I think he's gonna it, he's gonna argue the intellect can only reach its end while the will can choose opposite opposite things. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, which is what makes the will an act. Well, well, uh, well, an active potency rather than a passive. Well, potency. actually, yeah. the well. So for for Saint Thomas, the the uh, the intellect is 
never going to judge something as true unless there's a certain impediment which is placed in it. So all men desire to know, obviously, and um, for example, all men are going to choose what they believe to be good, uh, even even when um, that is a that that's a false choice due to some impediment. So I don't. So I'm just trying to think this out out loud, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. if that adds anything yeah, well, to the conversation. Basically, <laughs> saying rationality is the at least this this article, I think he's saying basically that rationality is the ability to choose opposites because natural things don't simply choose between opposites, right? Mm. So um, the sun, it can simply heat stuff, it can light stuff, but it, the sun can't make something cold is what he's saying. Okay. It, it, yeah, there are, yeah uh, there are outcomes which we can a priori uh, just reject. Um, so for example, we cannot, God could bring about a state of affairs where he picks Israel to be his nation, or he could bring about a state of affairs where he picked the Canaanites, uh, for example, if he so chose, it's a matter of grace. Mm -hmm. But there, but we know for a fact, a priori, that God wouldn't do something akin to, uh, I don't know, uh, create a world where uh, just everybody is predestined to be tortured from the outset, and no one has any choice otherwise. I think that one is just an exercise of a pure arbitrary maliciousness, whereas the other ones, at the very least, have some sort of redemptive quality, which kind of at least makes them worth considering. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see where he gets to talking about the will here. Hold on. This oh. is the problem with SCOTUS, is he just goes on and on and on. Oh, yeah, trust me, I it's understand. It's what odd, because... What philosopher doesn't? <laughs> let's see, let's see... Thomas oh, here we go. So he, he, I'll, I'll read the next article. Maybe we pick up from here. So he says, as for the second point, Aristotle seems to have understood the distinction to stem from the fact that a natural form is a principle for making only one pair of opposites, that which resembles itself naturally, just as this is this and not its opposite. So basically, the only opposite we can determine is that it's not its opposite. Right. But a form that is in the intellect, in the way of knowledge, informs the mind, is a principle for representing opposites by an intentional likeness, just as knowledge is a virtual likeness of opposites. Medical science is both the knowledge of health and sickness. All right, so he's basically saying these aren't real opposites, basically. Yeah. In that sense. All right, where does he talk about the will then? Okay. It seems like it's going to be down here. Oh, he, Later. here we go. All right. Oh, here we go. A distinction in itself, nature and will. All right. So opinion of SCOTUS. As for this second article, then, we must first investigate the distinction in itself and then see what Aristotle thought about it. All right. So I could not read this except for the notes that Walter gives to help us navigate this. Or he says, mm -hmm. So as for the first, keep in mind the primary distinction of active potency stems from the radically different way they elicit their operations. All right. For if we can somehow distinguish them because one acts to this, another regarding to that, a distinction is not immediate. All right, where does he get to the will then? All right. Uh, for either the potency of itself is determined to act so that so far as it itself is concerned, it cannot fail to act when not impeded from without, or it is not so determined, but can perform this or that act or its opposite or can either will or not act at all a potency of the first sort is called nature whereas the second one is called will so i think what he's getting at here is he's saying right that the sun it doesn't get to choose whether or not it's going to heat stuff if the sun is operating it's always going to heat stuff right yeah. if we have um a block of ice it's always going to feel cold the ice can't decide to stop feeling cold but the will can choose whether or not to act. So it can choose opposites of whether or not it is going to act. So even just in the case of there's a piece of cake in front of us, it's not morally wrong to eat the cake, but it's also not necessarily morally good to eat the cake. We get to freely choose whether or not we're going to eat the cake simply on the basis of our will choosing it. And I think that's what he's getting at here. Okay. Uh, I, I still don't get how, because Thomas is affirming the ability for opposite choices to happen. Yeah. Why would I that be in contradiction with it being a, uh, an, an, a, a uh, oh my, some dog is not happy. A, um, a, a what, what am I trying to think of? The word, words don't work right now. The appetitive, oh, yeah, the appetitive faculty and it's um, desiring towards the 
object of judgment from the intellect. Well, he's saying it's not just on the judgment of the intellect. It's freely within the will itself that chooses. Yeah, the appetite can can assent or not assent. Yeah. Yeah, so I, he, I don't think there's a disagreement uh, here. Okay, so you're saying basically that within the will, the will can then choose to assent or not assent to what the intellect presented? Yes. Okay. Perhaps. Um, as maybe you could clarify a little bit more what you mean by the appetite then. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Um, oh my, this is a weird setup. So <laughs> when it comes to the aptitive faculty, let me... Oh, there's my cursor. He's a new set. Much... There's a new Shia Alex set now. I just that's what I was he's doing. Gonna, Here we go. You're like your third change. <laughs> Let me. Sorry, it's gonna take me a second to pull this up. It's prima pars probably. Because I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, the um, the the uh, anthropology is not one of my strong suits, and I've been reading a lot more about it recently to try to try to catch up. Uh, I'm gonna reload one more time. Yeah. But if it doesn't if it doesn't fix again, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna deal with it. But it makes me like 15 seconds behind, so it's super annoying. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when it comes to what the appetite is, I don't see a I don't see a definition which Thomas gives directly. But the appetite is going to be the <laughs> faculty wherein our someone our, our in the souls chat are reaching spot. out to the good. Oh, De Veritate, question 24. Oh my, that's gonna be like 20 questions. <laughs> yeah. I this is the problem with SCOTUS. There's a giant like body of different points there before we got to what he was talking about. Yeah, De Veritate is great. You uh, mind if I ask a question really quick? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Do the fathers touch on this uh, question at all about the will and the uh, intellect? I do think they do. I think St. Maximus, um, on his whole thing about the gnomic will, gets very close to what Scotus is getting at of the will as a rational power. Um, but this is just from a general engagement with Maximus. I haven't delved in depth with his writings on the will to affirm in certain that he agrees fully with Scotus here, at least in principle here with Scotus. I do know that Maximus, by way of St. John Damascene, was very influential on Western views of the will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think also Augustine is cited here a few times, but I think that um, Damascene actually tended to be a little more influential on in a lot of views of the will than Augustine was, from what I understand about this. I, I remember reading a while ago a, blogs, uh, a blog post by Phaser. He actually conceded that Augustine, to some extent, yep. was, a, was a, a soft voluntarist. Yeah, and J John Milbank has conceded that late Augustine is a voluntarist. Mm. So... <laughs> Here is, this is from De Veritate 24.1, I think. I'm not going to scroll all the way up there. Just wall of text. <laughs> if the term is taken literally, free choice denotes an act. But by usage, it has been transformed to mean the principle of the act. So notice, free choice is the principle of a certain act. Mm -hmm. When we say that man that a man has free choice, we do not mean that he is actually judging freely, but that he has within himself that by which he can judge freely. So it's a certain um, active potency or power, which is in man. Consequently, if the act of judging freely should contain anything which goes beyond the capacity of a power, then it will designate a habit or a power perfected by some habit. You don't really need to understand that, but we'll keep going. To get angry with moderation, for instance, implies something which goes beyond the capacity of the irascible power. For the irascible power cannot moderate the passion of anger by itself unless it is perfected by a habit by means of which there is impression upon it the moderation of reason. If, however, to judge freely should not imply anything that exceeds the capacity of the power, free choice will not designate anything but a power without any further addition. Just as to get angry does not mean to go beyond the capacity of the irascible power, and for this reason its proper principle is a power and not a habit. Because notice the logic here, that entire wall of text right there after I initially explained, is going to be Thomas describes a habit between, as something between power and act. So it's, 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 it's something which um, orders the soul towards a certain uh, choice or actualization of a certain power.
Now it is clear that to judge, if nothing is added, does not go beyond the capacity of a power, because it is the act of a power, reason by its own nature, without requiring the addition of any habit. Similarly, what is added in the adverb freely does not exceed the scope of the power. For something is said to be done freely inasmuch as it is in the power of the one doing it. But the fact that something is under our control is in us as the consequence of an operative power, not of a habit. The power is the will. Okay. So all that wall of text is just providing definitions for his conclusion. Free choice, accordingly, does not designate a habit, but the power of will or reason. One as subordinated to the other. Thus, the act of choosing proceeds from one of them in subordination to the other in accordance with what the philosopher says. Choice is in the aptitude on the part of the intellectual power or understanding on the part of the aptitude. It is clear, too, from what has been said, why some are led, were led to hold that free choice is a habit. For some have held this on account of the addition which free choice makes to will and reason, the subordination of the one to the other. But this cannot have the character of a habit if the term is taken in the proper sense. For a habit is a quality by which a power is inclined to act. Others, considering the faculty with which we judge freely, have said that free choice is a power modified by a habit. But, as has already been said, to judge freely does not go beyond the nature of the power. There you so go. that just establishes that it's a power, though, right? Yeah, but it still doesn't seem to clarify whether or not specifically what SCOTUS is interested in is if, if it's a rational power. What do you mean by rational power? So that's what SCOTUS is saying that rational power is its ability to choose between alternatives. So the ability. Not, not, okay. Not, okay. So, so let me let me make the main comparison. Right? Is it like, um, for example, our our breathing? Right? Where we simply we don't choose to breathe. Right? We simply continue breathing. We can will to stop breathing, but that's our just naturally our breathing continues as it is. Or is it like our ability to choose between things that's not necessarily require necessarily following from the natural power itself? Okay. Repeat that again in one second. Sorry, I was having to yeah. send the link for William of Ockham. Yeah, so basically uh, is the question whether or not it's a power like um, like a habitual power or is it a deliberative power? Well, By habitual, it, we mean something like uh, the heart beating, the lungs breathing. Oh, actually, yeah. The lungs breathing is a better one because we have some control over that when we deliberate. But if we just yeah. leave it alone, it's yeah. habitual well, that we breathe in and out. Well, Scotus would say really the intellect, for example, is a lot like our breathing, right? So our breathing right. just continues naturally, but our will can influence our breathing. But it's really our will choosing not to breathe, which then our breathing, our faculty of breathing then follows that command. So Scotus could say we could will to stop thinking about something, at which point our will is now given a command to our intellect, which our intellect follows. But well, it's the for, will itself that's choosing then. So we'd say the intellect is like a power like that, like breathing or something like that um, versus – and he would say that's within the general category then of non-rational or natural powers. So it's within the same category of our heart beating, of the sun shining. All of these things simply continue necessarily. Um, or if they're stopped, it's because of some impediment, such as the will in the case of breathing. Um, if we had like a sword stabbed through us, our heart, our heart might stop beating because there was an impediment that forced it to stop. But there wouldn't be something – does that make sense? Basically, there wouldn't be yeah. something that um, chooses versus the will. There doesn't have to be any impediment to make it stop. It can simply choose between alternatives. Okay, so I'm, I'm still not understanding why that would be against the Thomistic view. Yeah, I guess now I'm wondering maybe if I'm misunderstanding the Thomistic view, because as I understood the Thomistic view before we started this discussion, yeah. it seemed to be that the will simply followed what it was presented by the intellect. No, 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 no. Uh, under the Thomistic view, there's the need for a... Uh, a dual sort of um, you're ascent. saying it's, it's the appetite that chooses but as i understand appetites right that's simply a desire for something it doesn't seem like the appetite itself can be the actual choosing between things no actually isn't a well, passion and no isn't that more of a passion i believe an appetite is uh more um actually you know never mind uh, i don't have enough <laughs> I, I, yeah. I i i think i might just be misunderstanding these terms yeah, with, yeah, with the, with the appetitive, yeah, with the appetitive faculty, that is the um, 
that that would be the direction of the soul towards the good, just as the the intellect is 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 towards the the true. So in in choosing, there is there's a need to verify that it's true and then to desire it as good. But right, this Scotus could say right if there that um the the wheel he says moves itself. And so if there was, for example, right, a piece of cake in front of us, we ultimately have the choice to choose whether to eat that piece of cake or not. Would you would you yes. agree with that? Yeah, of course. Of course. OK. And you would say that it's ultimately the will then that's choosing whether or not to. Yes. OK. So, yes, maybe I was misunderstanding the Thomas view, at least it's been presented to me by quite a number of Thomists who seem to phrase it in such a way that it feels like there's almost no free will because they talk about how the intellect is simply moved by, or the will is simply moved by the intellect. <laughs> Thanks. Well, the, but the, it could the just will, be the case here I mean, of misunderstanding the, the Thomas position. I mean, it seems more like Thomas is just describing the nature of the will by... Um, by the concurrence, the concurrence of different uh, being presented with different things by different faculties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like for example, the uh, the will is presented by the intellect with something which the the intellect judges it true, and then the the will assents to it uh, in mm -hmm. in the aptitude faculty as as being something desirable. Mm -hmm. So that that that's at least how I read Thomas. But again, I'm a paleo Thomist. So I just, <laughs> I literally just read Thomas and then maybe I mean, some that, Lagrange that, here and there. Maybe it is the later commentators upon Thomas then that are more they, leaning they, towards this interpretation of Thomas. Honestly, the later commentators on Thomas have, uh, at least according to, to what I've heard, screwed up quite a few things. So okay. I wouldn't be surprised. Because, yeah, for example, Banya's, for example, with his physical pre-motion of God basically influencing the intellect in such a way that it's simply going to move the will in that way to lead to a certain result. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, so that would seem then, right, that the will isn't moving itself, freely choosing between alternatives, but rather that it's the intellect moving the will to its end. And that as the wait, sole wait. cause of... A explain how you're reading Banyas again. Yeah, and I haven't read Banyas directly. It's from secondary sources I'm controlling yeah. on Banyas. Oh, are you, uh, are, are you studying something like O'Neill's work here? It's more probably from just engagement with Thomas of reading the Scotus literature and then talking with Thomas about this. Mm. So maybe it is more from other Thomas that I'm drawing this from who've misunderstood Thomas here. But it does seem that from what I understand about it, that it's right, the intellect is moving the will. But Scotus says that the will moves itself. The will is the cause of its own motion. Hmm. Yeah, I'm... It's... Yeah, I mean, I also have a bit of experience from uh, Thomas as well, and my general impression is mm -hmm. something along these lines. Basically, the intellectual faculty is what's judged in man. So the intellectual faculty comes to its own conclusions, it reasons about things, it can reason properly or improperly, mm -hmm. and if it reasons improperly, then uh, that's something in which it's judged or condemned for. Uh, whereas if it judges properly, it's rewarded. But of course, the intellect, given the fall, is unable to do that and that's what requires some something akin to uh grace in order in order to do that and mm -hmm. then you kind of have a distinction drawn between uh necessary and sufficient grace necessary grace being grace which is necessary to move uh, the the intellect mm -hmm. towards something but um because it's only there necessary necessarily um the ability for the intellect to uh, reach the proper conclusion is there has what's has is there virtually so mm -hmm. it's possible but it's not something that any will will ever can actualize unless uh, god also moves the intellect with uh, some sort of sufficient grace and at which point the sufficient grace uh, because that is something god bestows mm -hmm. out of his mercy um, god is not obliged to give it so anything that uh, doesn't receive it uh, God isn't condemned for it. Uh, God doesn't isn't responsible for that evil. Whereas anything that is given, um, that that sufficient grace, uh, could only have come to that conclusion because it was given that grace, and that's why it's moved towards uh, it's moved towards the good. Or yeah. the, like that's just my general impression. Like, uh, is that a fair yeah. analysis? Yeah, maybe. The, 
My first thought that came up with this is that right it seems like for scotus the will simply reason the intellect rather simply reasons as well as it can presents that to the will and then at that point it's the will that chooses yes so it's um the intellect right isn't making choices about how well it's reasoning it simply reasons as best it can and presents that to the will so for scotus for example since the will can move itself the will could choose something contrary to what the intellect presents. Yes. And that actually happens quite frequently, Scotus would say. So when we're committing a sin, we're actually choosing something contrary to what the intellect has presented. Yes, 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 exactly. You would agree? Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Because that would be That's interesting. The, the, the dissidence between our various faculties of the soul would be really the definition of, of, of sin. I actually, internally speaking, according to internal principles. I, I wanted to ask, so there's a, a very common, in the same book I said earlier, in the first book of al Kafi, there's a very common like theme that's repeated of where the idea of implementing intellect, uh, like implementing intellect in of itself is good. And that if you come to wrong, if, like, let's say, for example, if you conclude an, an incorrect thing, right, or you do a sin or something like that, you haven't even implemented your intellect at all. And I was curious what your thoughts on that are. That it's even that it's, if it's even possible to improperly uh, improperly use your intellect, or if that, even, uh, or if that uh, in yes. a sense is considered an uh, application of uh, intellect. I yes. would say you can, insofar as your will would be influencing your intellect to act incorrectly, right? So maybe you have you've now learned. Maybe for let me give an example, right? You now have learned that your math skills aren't good enough, and you need to improve your math skills. But mm -hmm. you now choose in your will to will contrary to that and purposely not improve your intellect and not learn better math, for example. Is that what you're getting at? Or Yeah, so like, for example, uh, there's, there's a lot of narrations that will say, for example, that like one who applies, his in, the one who actually applies his intellect will, will result in the true religion, right? Yeah. See, Regardless of, so, and the, and the idea here is that if, if, uh, if you are on the false religion, for example, you haven't actually applied your intellect properly. Or yeah. that you have even you're not actually using your faculty of intellect the way it's designed to at least. Yeah. But so, <laughs> I think we're having a scholarly discussion, so I just uh, <laughs> yeah. got my kaffee on and everything. Yeah. Hold up. Hold yeah. Up, hold up. One second. I was thinking, but give me a second. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Scotus ends up saying here essentially that it would be our will, which is choosing now to influence our intellect, to apply our intellect. But our intellect simply moves in just the same way any sort of other natural faculty moves, simply that it's probably under a much greater degree to the influence of the will than those. Right, so just like maybe we might choose to eat, right? So if we want to choose to eat healthy, we wouldn't say that the morally praiseworthy part of that and the, the important part of that is the actual movement of our hands and the actual eating. It's our will influencing our body to eat the salad, right? It's not our actual eating of the salad. I mean, it is the eating of the salad, but it's because mm -hmm. the will has commanded your body to do that, if that makes sense. And I would say yeah. that's in the same sense as the intellect applying itself to study. The intellect applies itself to the study because the will has willed that the intellect apply itself to the study. I'll be back one second. But yes, I yeah. hear what you're saying. Sorry, I started no, the thing. Uh, so maybe we can move on to something that is a more clear disagreement about whether then the will or the intellect is greater than. Because it seems to me then that if the mind, if the will is what's choosing all of this, it's fundamentally the will then that is what is morally praiseworthy or blameworthy. And that it is what perfects man is our will choosing to do, to do virtue, choosing to believe, choosing to have charity. I mean, charity is the highest virtue and charity is the perfection of the will so that the will will choose to love others for their own sake and not simply as a means for our own sake. And so it seems that the will then is the highest faculty within man. Well, I... Yeah, that's. I mean, I'm, I'm, other... I'm, so here's kind of one of my pauses. From what I understand, mm -hmm. the the um, the will and the intellect; these are two. They're formally distinct in the soul. Yeah. That is, they're not really separable from one another. Oh yeah, of course, uh, yeah. So I'm kind of curious as to whether or not we can say that when uh, really the intellect and the uh, will are, if they're if they are formally distinct, then wouldn't it also be the case that 
um, the praise that one gets is shared by the other, like, or inseparable from the other. Yeah, I would say in some sense yeah. that there's Right. In St. Bonaventure's work, um, the itinerarium, it's mm. the itinerarium in mentis deum, the ascent of the mind into God. And um, is it Bonaventure then talks about here how he talks about how the three faculties of the mind, memory, intellect, and will, and a lot of the other scholastics, memory simply gets folded into intellect there. Mm -hmm. The memory, intellect, and will all get taken up into God in this ascent to God. Mm -hmm. But it's fundamentally at this level of the will, that the will is the perfection in man. Because it's mm -hmm. where, first of all, the three, the other two faculties come to rest, right? As Bonaventure talks about how the memory brings forth the intellect and the memory and the intellect together bring forth the will. But it's in the will fundamentally that we're willing then the good. And so it's where then we reach our perfection. And man is also perfected through the will, through charity. Okay, I see that. Yeah. And so you would say then, right, the other two, the mem er, the intellect and the memory, they come to share in the goodness of the will. That it's the renew and also the body as well, right? The body also participates within divine glory. But we wouldn't say then the body is equal to or greater than the, uh, the soul. And right. also just as lower, as Christian was pointing out earlier, that lower faculties are at the service of higher faculties, that it seems to then follow from that that um <laughs> i'm sorry this is just a great this is a great comedy moment this is a great bit yeah <laughs> but um yeah no yeah it, it seems to follow from that then that the um intellect what's i gonna say yeah that the intellect is at the service of the will that the will is fundamentally the highest principle are you asking that to me? Yeah, I, I was bringing up all sort of all these different points. And what, what do you think? Well, I, I could just I could just flip that on its head and say because the will is, um, because in in order for the uh, the choice of the will to exist, there must be the apprehension of the intellect. Therefore, the will is dependent on the intellect. So. Well, the will is dependent in a sense on the intellect. That's true, but. Will intellect exist for the sake of the will? That would need to be proven. Well, wh the reason we know anything, right, is because the intellect presents things to the will, so mm. the will can choose between alternatives. I would deny that that's the, the end of the intellect. Yeah. Well, I would also say then, why is charity the highest theological virtue and the only one that remains in heaven if charity is the perfection of the will? Because uh, when it comes to both faith and hope, those are things not present, but in heaven. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, that and that and that's a bit disingenuous because when you think of the the virtues, the virtues are infused habits in the will. So asking, mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. okay. Well, these are because both faith the and hope are also of the will and those disappear. Therefore the will is inferior because two out of three of the virtues, like you could, but, this, well, this faith, argument isn't necessarily. I would say faith, what faith about, what about the, primarily, yeah, sorry. What, oh, I, I was going to bring up what about uh, Christ? Because even Thomas acknowledges that Christ doesn't have the virtues of faith and hope. He doesn't require those being mm -hmm. God. But he does have, of course, the virtue of charity. Yeah, That's but, uh, just ingrained in who he is. Uh, well, what I is what is that, faith? Well, fa uh, faith is the faith. intellect assenting to the teachings of the church. Oh, okay, I believe it's, if it's I assenting believe faith... to something, then it's an act of the will. Because but where where is because faith isn't in, isn't infused into the intellect. Mm. Faith is a virtue which is infused well, into the into the will. Well, mm. Faith takes an it's act, a habit. but it's fundamentally our mind coming to know the truth of the faith. And coming to know them as true. So it is our real, there has to be an act of the will in order for us to have faith that is true, in order for us to receive that. But it fundamentally then is located in our intellect, so that our intellect can know what the church teaches. Hope is sort of somewhat in both. So we can maybe set hope aside for a second. Because that one's more, that's probably a more complicated one. But then in charity, charity is fundamentally the perfection of the will. Because mm -hmm. love is the choice of what we are going to love, what good we are going to love most. That is a choice of the will. And the will comes to love the good of the other person or God for their own sake and not for your own sake. 
Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, so, so, a thought, so, so a thought is occurring to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think wouldn't all these virtues require some exercise of both? So, for example, yeah, I think uh, so. Well, yeah, yeah. Charity is willing the good of the other as other, but in order to will the good for the other, you have to comprehend what the other yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say for it to actually be a true, you know, for something to be defined as charity, you have to intellectually process that what you're. You have to have intention. Yeah. Right? You have to have intellectual yeah. Uh, yeah. So, rationality but, um, of comprehension. Yeah, of I would yeah. say when it comes to when it comes to where a, when it comes to where virtue is infused, a virtue is, infu- is a habit which is infused into 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 the will. I, I I deny what you're saying about the the nature of of faith. Okay. That's why I don't think that the argument follows. This is what Bonaventure argues in the itinerarium in chapter four, is that faith primarily relates to the intellect and hope to the memory and charity to the will. Let me see the question to sum up. I I would definitely need to read Bonaventure on that one before making... Hold on. And um, St. John of the Cross makes the same argument Mm. as the three different facts of how the... um, different theological virtues aid the ascent of the soul into God for St. John of the Cross as well. And I, th- I think this is in Augustine as well, these specific three. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Um, trying to see if I can find it here in... Putting a kufi on when you have long hair is difficult. True. Yeah, that is true. This is... This is why I just don't like Koofies. Yep. <laughs> I, I would say that all of them, right, I'll play a role in all the faculties mm. of the mind, but it's which one they're primarily located in, if that I makes see. sense. So, okay, okay. so charity is primarily were... an act of the will. Faith yeah. is primarily an act of the intellect. Uh, the and intellect I, and okay. hope it, the memory. Yeah, but, but I would also say the hope relates very much to the will as well, as Scotus points out, because hope is really basically the perfection of the effectio commode within the will as well. But I would I would explain the deficiency, um, since I would I would affirm that uh, the object is residing primarily in the intellect. Uh, the fact that faith and hope are inferior virtues, which will which will necessarily mm-hmm. go away, is the fact that we we now live. It, it's in our current economy. And the fact that faith and hope have its as its objects things which are not so, seen. So you don't think our ultimate end is to love God then? It's a good question. Because it seems that for I, I, Thomas, and, and I, the ultimate end is to know God, not to love God. Versus for Scotus, the ultimate end is to love God, which is an act of the will. Mm. That would be correct. I wanted to. I want to ask. Do you think the intentions are um, contingent? Are not the intentions. The virtues are contingent upon intention. So, for something to be truly have faith, it has to have its contingent upon an intention of being faithful. But yes, this, in the this, sense that we have to initiate it, but it is a habit within the souls. So we don't every second have to be willing to have it in order to have that virtue at that moment. If that makes yeah. sense. When it, when it comes and, to the when it comes to the the nature of charity, in it in our beatific life, um, mm-hmm. the life of the blessed, our, our charity is going to be dependent on and come from uh, the apprehension of knowledge. Because really, the, the, distinct, as you, the distinction between the intellect and the will is one of um, acts and objects. Mm-hmm. So I, I, think, I, I think there's too much of an arbitrary distinction made between faith, hope, and charity, if, if, you're, if you're getting what I'm saying. Would you say that they, between would you the say acts they, of faith, open charity, I, I think you say that they all and like, for example, that charity necessarily is contingent upon a possession of faith and hope. No, no, because no. Uh, we, Christ, we, no, because Christ just himself, have it, yeah, we just have oh, in the yeah, chat yeah. here throw yeah, up yeah. the quote, throw up the quote from Zero Hour in the chat. We just proved Saint Thomas is a scotus here with reference to divine things which are superior to the soul. Okay, with reference to divine things which are superior to the soul. In this way, to will is more excellent than to understand, as to God, to will God or to love him is more excellent than to know Uh, him. uh, I actually threw this last part of this quote, to love um, God, uh, to to will God or to love him is more excellent than to know him. I actually quote, there was a quote of a um, St. Thomas like quote bot on Twitter um, that tweeted this out and I retweeted it and I said, therefore the will is greater than the intellect. And you can, if you search that up, you can find my whole long debate with Urban Hannon on Twitter about that. 
Um, but yeah. his argument was that basically that just because the act of the will is greater than the act of the intellect doesn't mean the will is greater than the intellect. But I don't see how that follows because the faculties are for the sake of some end. So if it seems that the act of willing to love God is greater than the act of knowing God, that the will is greater than the intellect. Mm. This Kofi is slipping off my head slowly. It's so annoying. It, it, and it seems this is also what's so beautiful about Christianity is it's a, as um, good as presents it is that it's fundamentally about love and our love of God. Mm. Okay. Let us yeah. found the quote. Okay, so let's read the whole quote in the question. Yeah. This is asking, let me just go up. You should probably take down the quote from the chat. Oh, yeah, it's covering yeah, me and Alex. It out. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay. You don't want to miss my is beautiful Is the will face. a higher power than the intellect, or is the opposite true? So. We seem to Actually, this would be a good top. question just to read it's in the whole. Scroll, scroll up at the top. It seems that the intellect is noble and higher. It seems he affirms the priority of the will here. No. <laughs> This is this is part of the difficulties. So if you read if you read if you read the um, the uh, treatises the uh, questions uh, disputed questions of Thomas, that's what he's going to put for the um, oh for the first because in the Summa the first thing listed is what he disagrees with. <laughs> mm. Oh, uh, is that the intellect is nobler, nobler and higher? Wait 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 Okay. To the okay, contrary, right. there we go. Wait, 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 wait. You might be right. Oh, no, then there's a reply. Down the that philosopher down. says that the intellect is the most excellent music. things which are in us. Therefore, wait, is he is he affirming the no, no, supremacy more... of the will right here? I think he no. did. Oh, I... oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay, we have to read this now. This is okay. <laughs> I think we should read the last thing first. Okay. A thing can be said to be more eminent than another, either simply or in a certain respect. For something to be shown to be simply better than another, the comparison must be made on the basis of what is essential to them and not on the accidentals. Blah, 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 blah. We already know what that means. The perfection <laughs> and dignity of the intellect consists in this, that the species of the thing which is understood is the intellect itself, since in this way it actually understands, and from this its whole dignity is seen. The nobility of the will and of its act, however, consists in this, that the soul is directed to some noble thing, in the very existence which that thing has of itself. Now it is more perfect, simply and absolutely speaking, to have within oneself the nobility of another thing than to be related to the noble thing outside of oneself. Wah, wah, we thought. Hence, if the will and the intellect are considered absolutely, and not with reference to this or that particular thing, they have this order, that the intellect is simply more excellent than the will. But he's going to continue to nuance this. But it may happen that to be related in some way to some noble thing is more excellent to have its nobility within oneself. This is the case, for instance, when the nobility of that thing is possessed in a way inferior to that which, is, which the thing has it within itself. But if the nobility of one thing is in another just as nobility or more nobly than it is in the thing to which it belongs, then without a doubt, that which has the nobility of that thing within itself is nobler than that which is related in any way whatsoever to that noble thing. So remember, simply, the intellect is better than the will, but if in this counterfactual case, the thing outside of oneself is more noble, then the will would be more noble. And he's about to, he's about to drop the bomb here. Now the intellect takes on the forms of... Uh, or things superior to the soul in a way inferior to that which they have in the things themselves. For the intellect receives things after its own fashion, as it is said in the causes. And for the same reason, the forms of things inferior to the soul, such as corporeal things, are more noble in the soul than in the things themselves. So if we're, if we're relating to, if, if we're just considering whether having th something within oneself or whether relating to something outside of oneself, having something within itself is obviously better. But depending on the object, if it has to do with a with a lesser thing, then the um, then it's obviously going to be inferior to have that within oneself. And uh, when we're dealing with a higher thing, to be tending towards that thing is going to be the superior act. The intellect can accordingly be compared to the will in three ways: absolutely and in general, without any reference to this or that particular thing. In this way, the intellect is more excellent than the will, just as it is more per perfect to possess that where there is dignity of a thing and that is merely related to its nobility. Two, with reference to material and sensible things. In this way, the intellect is simply 
nobler than the will. For example, to know a stone intellectually is nobler than to will it, because the form of the stone is in the intellect inasmuch as it known by the intellect in a nobler way than it is in itself as desired by the will. Three, okay, this is where he drops the bomb. With reference to divine things which are superior to the soul, in this way to will is more excellent than to understand, as to will God or to love him is more excellent than to know him. This is because the divine goodness itself is more perfectly in God himself as he is desired by the will than the participated goodness is in us as known by the intellect. Boom. So it's a lot more nuanced than that. Hmm. But I will okay, concede. Okay, Michael Lofton. I will concede. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I, will concede <laughs> I will concede that in divine things mm-hmm. that, um, that the we, will we, is superior. We, because we, 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 need, we, we need to go... Re- um, rephrase some of the stuff then in the Summa on the article in Beatitude we read earlier because really the fundamental most important thing is our love of God not our our knowing of God okay uh, we're gonna loop back are we gonna loop right back <laughs> around to the material pleasure no. we're gonna go yeah. right back around to the material yeah, but, 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 but 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 um <laughs> Uh, but the beatific vision would still be necessary in yeah in to know god you, we, of course we have to know god to love him yeah i would agree with yeah. that Do, uh, so i'm not I'm objecting a, to the beatific vision i'm just saying that the ultimate good of the beatific vision is our love of god more so than our not our simple knowledge of god so so uh, go. so biz uh so uh huh. just out of curiosity uh, you know more about polymatism than i would mm-hmm. uh do do the Palamites have a notion of the beatific vision? Because from what I've heard, uh, many some some will claim that you don't even in the afterlife uh, experience God in the beatific vision, but the beatific vision is something akin to experiencing God fully within his energies. So we never see the that, essence. Yeah, but only the energies. Only yeah. the energies even it, in heaven. I think yeah. they would say that the energies, though, are God manifesting himself in such a way as we can understand. Um and that they are still God. They wouldn't say the energies are something external to God, but that they are God, as I understand, P- Palamas. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So they're so they're not like a via media. They no, are. That's what. No, um, not, that's yeah. what. So that's for example. That's how they. That's how they understand. Um, mm. fa- uh, uh, fa- uh, Thomas Hopkins was in, in his uh, in his book on orthodoxy mm-hmm. in his four part, part, part book on the aspect on theology when he's talking about the essence energy distinction. He's this is explicitly how they understand. You know, the classic God is love. Is that the energies are in, in are God in of themselves? So it's I still, see. in a sense, the beatific vision that you're experiencing God, right? You know, but it's not through the essence; it's through the energies. Yeah, yeah. Th- Sounds this like is a actually why. Cope. Yeah, no, this is actually why I'm thinking a <laughs> lot of uh, Loskiites are very uh, go farther than what Palamite, Palamas intended because uh, I think, I think even, so. like I think he even has a doctrine of divine simplicity because uh, from There's what my brother. I- Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so there's a book I picked up recently from Zlib on the, the good store Zlib, um, <laughs> which is uh, Torstein <laughs> Tolefson's book. I think it's called something like Participation in Late Antiquity and Early Christianity, mm. where he surveys this topic of participation in divine activity, first in some pagan sources, then in St. Basil, and then he focuses on three different church fathers and looks at a few different aspects of <laughs> um, Gregory of Nyssa, Dionysius, and Maximus. And then he goes in the last chapter and compares them to Palamas, and he actually argues that it's probably something closer to a virtual distinction Palamas has than what we would call like a real distinction. But at the same time, he does point out some differences with Thomas. I think that there is actually some similarity here, possibly with Scotus, in the sense that they're both articulating a positive conception of divine infinity, of divine infinity not merely as apophatic, but divine infinity as God infinitely transcending all things, and so that there could be a sense in which then there could be energies that are fully God, but are in some way manifesting himself in a limited sense, if that makes sense. No, 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 that does. And uh, out of curiosity, do you guys in Shia Islam have a notion of the beatific vision? Um, so there's a, a very, I mean, um, I'm, I'm not too like studied on it, but there's a very common mm. uh, aspect of like the, um, the light of God, right? Mm. The nerd of God, which is, I would say is the, the most comparable thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know if, uh, I don't know if we understand that to be created or uncreated. So I can't comment on any more than that. Fair enough. Yeah. It could be possible that's a, uh, it's a created, uh, thing, but it could be possible that's uncreated too. But that, that everybody. 
Steven. Everybody, I'm sorry to end the fun, but it is one o'clock in the morning. If, uh, <laughs> if you guys want to continue on here, I don't care. But um, I, I should probably am hop off. I have to get up. Yeah, early. I have. Yeah. Um, right here is. I'm not going to read it now. I guess we could. If you want to do something later, Byzantine Scotus, we can. But this is a specific question, actually. Um, let's see what it specifically is. Specific question asking in the in this commentary on the sentences. Uh, whether beatitude consists more in things belonging to the will than in things belonging to the intellect. So I think that'd be an interesting thing to read yeah, over together be. and talk about. So we could do that later, but it is one o'clock in the morning. All so right, yeah, let's continue this another like, time. At least another hour. How, how yeah. long was how long was the the nuke stream? The last stream. That it was, was like two hours. hours. Oh, so, Ivan's here. Hey. Hey. Yeah, hey. Hi. Hey. Hey. <laughs> So that's like what five hours today, then uh, four, like three hours, or so eight hours, or so ten hours. I spent ten hours with Christian over the past seventy-two. Of them. <laughs> so- <laughs> okay, sorry I have to go, but um, thank you everybody for for being here, being here, even Ivan for your last like two minutes being here. Nice uh, work, appreciate yeah. it. Nice work. So every- Everybody watching, uh, make sure you like that subscribe button on mine. Go to Byzantine Scotus. Go to John Fisher 2.0. Go, go to everybody. Make sure you smash their subscribe button. Um, and then also, uh, what's also important, you get a Militant Thomist slash Radical Numenite mug. And uh, follow me on Twitter at Militant Thomist and Patreon.com slash Militant Thomist. I think that's about it. Any final words, everybody? Uh. I don't have yes, any thanks for having us, Hunter.